see the delay, but that's exactly what it does. It delays until it's, uh, uh, until it's false. So in practice, it's the same as putting it inside a, um, uh, it, it's, it's the same as uh, abstracting over a, a, a unit, just having a function from units at the top. So, so there isn't anything particularly magical going on there. Uh, okay, so cut covering on total will be defaults rather than partial, and they certainly could. And actually, the only reason they're not is, is it's kind of a path to adoption thing, this, this idea that um, um, Idris is aiming to be a programming language targeting generally has to program with ML programmers. And if we were to put, uh, to make a, you know, the fact that function has to cover all inputs and function has to total as the default, that would immediately be another strange thing that people have to get over. So I really like this, uh, this idea of um, the language strangeness budget. So anyone encountered this, uh, this concept? So um, uh, Steve Padnick wrote a blog post about it called the language strangeness budget. It says, if you're implementing a new <coughs> language, you really have to think about who your target audience is and how many things they're willing to tolerate that they don't, that, that they don't have in their current language. So there's only a certain number of strange things that you can do. And I think by having dependent types, we've basically already blown our language strangeness budget. Um, so the next step, you know, eventually, when people are used to having full dependent types, we can start adding types. <coughs> and uh, at the moment, I think it's, it's, it's something that if you know what you're doing, if, if you're comfortable with it, it's not a problem to have that, to, to, to like, reset the default to, to totally yourself. So uh, talking about this concept of language strangeness budget to uh, the Haskell Simon the other week. Simon Payne goes to Marlow. And uh, Simon PJ said, oh, I don't think we have that in Haskell. I think we have a language strangeness threshold. In that <laughs> people don't like new features of Haskell if they're not really <laughs> weird enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, uh, I'm envious of, uh, <laughs> of, this, of this kind of user. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a nice concept to think about. If you, if you have to be thinking about you know, what are the trade-offs in a new language, why might the language have done something this way rather than what you can see as a better way, well, just think about the, the interaction between the language and its, its users and its target users. So just think about the, the amount of strangeness that you, you're, you're able to add. Um, when we learn more about theorem proving So we're getting a little uh, sort of lower level in the question now. I didn't go too much into theorem proving. I just showed you some examples. But uh, everything you need to know about theorem proving is um, uh, or the basics of everything you need to know about uh, are uh, astonishingly documented. So there's, uh, if you go to docs.idrisland.org, there's a few, so as well as the Idris tutorial, there's a few uh, more specialized tutorials on things like uh, doing crucify induction um, on uh, working with spatial systems uh, and so on. So there's, there's a few tutorials there. That's probably the best place to go at the minute to learn uh, about things that are going more depth. Uh, so a couple more questions. Uh, is it possible to extract Idris to Haskell? So I think the reason people ask this is just thinking about uh, interoperability between Idris and Haskell. So if you're extracting Idris to Haskell, you, you, you maybe get access to uh, a larger collection of libraries. But I think that's, it's not quite as simple as that, unfortunately. Because if you go to, if you look at the libraries on, on Hackage, they're, they're assuming a certain amount that the code is using those libraries. So maybe you have to implement instant tests, for example, for these libraries to be useful. And maybe there is, there's an assumption that oh, these libraries are written as uh, assuming uh, lazy evaluation and it just would be using strict evaluation. So potentially, if I extracted to Haskell, you would get access to more stuff, um, but it's probably not so simple. That said, it is certainly possible to extract Idris to Haskell. You would have to um, put quite a few, I think you'd have to generate quite a few unsafe coerces in the resulting code if you, uh, if you wanted it to um, actually get through the Haskell type checker. And you'd have to be a little bit careful to make sure that, uh, uh, that, that if you're using GHC, the GHC doesn't uh, somehow um, optimize your code in the wrong way, making the wrong assumptions about uh, how your types work. But in principle, it's certainly possible. Um, Angular, for example, does, uh, if, you, if you compile your Angular program, then I think the default way to do that is, is via Haskell. And it might actually be a good thing to do, just in the, in the short term, to get a better compiler than we currently have. It might just be to say, you know what, GHC has a good back end, why don't we use, use that temporarily? So it might not be a bad idea to do that. Um, uh, what is the hardest or most annoying thing about implementing it? So I think it's the same as the hardest and most annoying thing about implementing Getting scoping rights, names. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, 
sensing a lot of, yeah, been there, done that. In the room. Um, so, um, and particularly because we have quite a lot of operations that manipulate syntax, so, so evaluation, unification, and so on. And um, in my, uh, either in my haste to implement things or in my desire to, um, to optimize things, sometimes things go a bit wrong. And, uh, and, and I think the most, most of the weirdest bugs come down to some kind of error in um, dealing with naming. So I would say that's, a, that's the most annoying thing. Uh, the last one for today, what's your favorite undocumented feature of Idris? Um, so I don't think I've ever properly documented the partial evaluator. So uh, we have a paper in, uh, myself and Ken Hand have a paper in ICFD uh, 2010, where we wrote about uh, the relationship between uh, dependent types and partial evaluation, and that um, the fact that you need to have an evaluator in the language depending on the language in the terms, how can you take advantage of that in order to get better performance of your program? So what I've been showing you, I've, I've briefly yesterday, I showed you this pattern of uh, define a data type, write an interpreter over that data type, and then that, that interpreter is the thing you run. Well, if the thing you're interpreting is something that you know is compile time, why not run the, your uh, interpreter over the program that you're <coughs> compile time, and then the program you run is the program you would have written, only you have more, uh, more guarantees that uh, have corrected it. <coughs> um, and so we actually use this partial evaluator for also specializing type classes, or uh, interface <coughs> So if you, have, um, if you have your interface dictionary known as compile time, then partially evaluate it away, and uh, your program's going to run a bit faster. But I've never properly documented it, and we get we can get some really seriously good performance benefits by uh, by using it in the uh, in the right way. So I think it's worth um, it's worth like, going a bit deeper on that and explaining it a bit better. But I haven't done it yet. <coughs> okay, so what we're going to talk about? I do have I haven't forgotten that I'm going to do a draw, but I'm going to do it um, I'm going to do it at the end for reasons that uh, for reasons that you'll see. <coughs> So, um, so what I'll do first, I want to talk about states, dealing with states. So let's imagine, so we're going to go to, uh, we're going to, going to, go to a more practical programming territory today. We're going to, we're going to try writing things that uh, people actually want to write when they're, when they're, when they're working in, you know, uh, when people are paying the money to write software, I believe people write things like uh, network service. So, um, so anyone, is anyone familiar with uh, the public Stockbits API, or has anyone ever written anything with it? Um, I, I, I like to ask this just because the different audiences I get, different numbers of hands go up. I, I am, and, um, actually, I'm sorry, exactly quite a few of you. Um, how many of you, how many of you enjoyed it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, one or two of you. Uh, probably, probably some of the ones I would have expected. <coughs> so um, the difficulty with writing software programs, or at least I felt the difficulty with writing software programs, is you have an API, and the API tells you, you know, what you have. It tells you, you know, you have a socket, um, and the, the, the bind function does something to the socket, and the accept function does something to the socket. But it doesn't really tell you, unless you, unless you go to the man pages, or unless you read one of these um, very large books by, uh, by Stevens, right, you don't necessarily um, get the details just by looking at the type of the API. So just to take you through what you have to do to create a server. Um, First thing you do is create a socket. So that socket is basically where the connection, a thing that's going to sit there waiting for connections from other machines. So you'll bind that socket to a port. So you have the web server, you'll bind it to port 80, you'll wait for connections on port 80. Uh, next thing you do is you listen for incoming connections. So other machines elsewhere on the internet will take your machine's address, take that port number, and if they do that, um, you, uh, um, you might accept the connection to that socket. If you accept the connection to that socket, then you will create another socket, which is the socket on which you do the communication with the client, and then you carry on listening for more connections. So this allows you to, um, this allows you to, to maybe um, create multiple concurrent connections and uh, deal with lots of incoming, uh, uh, incoming requests at once. So there's quite a few things you have to do in order to get a connection to a server up and running, and there's quite a few things you have to think about if, for example, you want to make it uh, <coughs> Um, there's actually already something a little bit more in here than what we've seen with uh, the door in the ATM, which is in this last set, accepting a connection. 
This is actually giving us a new socket, so a new resource that we have to think about, a, a new thing we have to communicate on, and a new thing that eventually when we're done we have to close. So we start with just, um, just the one socket and we end with two. Uh, so that's already something that we couldn't do with this uh, DSL approach. So because this is quite complicated, it's a really good idea when you have something um, complicated with a sequence of steps that you have to think about to give uh, nice types to your API, and then the nice types in your API will give the users of that API some hints about what's supposed to happen. So let's do that. Let's give it a nice typed API. <laughs> this nice typed API will tell us what we have to do. <laughs> so just do, um, I mean, this is, I mean, six by obvious really, isn't it? It's, uh, uh, this, 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 uh, to create a socket, we need to say um, what kind of socket it is and what protocol it's going to run on. And because these things are enumerated things, obviously they're numbers. Uh, if we create a socket, that's going to return us a new socket, which is the descriptor for the thing that we're going to work with, which is obviously uh, an int. <laughs> because ints are good ways of representing file handles. <laughs> um, now, once we've got that socket, we're going to bind it to a port. And the socket that we created is an int, so obviously we pass it a socket. Here, an int. Um, and uh, oh, this is a length, so it's not an int. <laughs> um, and we've got a structure here that explains what the address is. Of course, that's going to give us back an int. So this int, uh, now, when you're programming in C, I, I guess quite a lot of you do this, you know that if, you, um, if a function might go wrong, it's a good idea to return an error code. And it's a good idea, and quite a common thing for the error code is to use a, an int. So, so that's an error code. Uh, then we'll listen, uh, we'll listen for a connection. Well, we, we, we might have a number of uh, connections that we're waiting for, so obviously because that's a number, it's an int. <laughs> um, and, and you see the point. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to make this a bit clearer. I'm going I'm to highlight the thing which are sockets in blue. So this, this is returning a socket, and then, then we're passing in the socket that we're working with, and we're listening for a connection on the socket we're working with. And you can see, because I've coloured these two in blue, uh, it's now clear that there are two sockets involved here, the socket that we're um, working with and the socket we've created. And then we're, when we eventually, uh, as a client, connect to a socket, you know, this, this is here is the socket, and then this is, because I didn't color it blue, is a potential error. Okay? Um, now we need to know which ones are the errors, so I've colored them in red. So just to keep things entertaining, some of them are both red and blue. <laughs> 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 But, um, but the language doesn't give you the, um, the ability to say all of the things that you'd actually like to say about the software. So if you're working in Haskell, for example, you can do quite a bit better. So there's, this, this is much improved, because at least in Haskell, you've got, um, well, so IO, uh, in, in IO, you're allowed to throw exceptions. So we'll deal with errors by throwing exceptions, and we'll handle the exceptions later on. So we don't have to worry about um, uh, error handling here. Oh, we do have to worry about error handling, but it's, uh, we, we do that using exceptions. And rather than rather than using int for everything we've got, we've at least got something here that says, you know, this is a socket, this returns a socket, this is a socket. Um, accept takes a socket and returns a new socket. So you've got it's definitely significantly better. But there's still something that's not quite right. There's still something missing that I'd really like to express in the type. And that is this tells us what we're allowed to do, but it doesn't tell us anything about the state the thing is in at each point. And if we get those states wrong, well our program basically won't work. And uh, uh, if you, have, if you have a program that type checks but it doesn't work, I think you're not using the type system as well as, uh, as, as you might. So you know this, this phrase, uh, well, type programs don't go wrong? Well, that's only true if you get the type wrong. <coughs> so what I want to do, when, uh, you know, by the end of this, in about an hour, uh, we should have a system in which we can really express what's happened with the states, how the state transitions work in this system, but also be, what would hope, nice and readable. <coughs> So um, this is uh, this is what we'd like to somehow express in uh, in the API. So we saw uh, something a bit like this with with the door system yesterday. Just have two states. Now we've got quite a few more states. So we'll uh, starting here, but starting in the ready state. Uh, this is just a newly created socket that we haven't done anything with yet. We'll bind it to a port. We'll listen for a connection. Uh, if we accept a connection, then we have one listening socket. If we have a new um, a new socket that's open, so there's, there's, there's two socket created. I don't, by the way, if anyone knows how to draw a two-dimensional 
oh, sorry, it was a three-dimensional um, <laughs> uh, state diagram one where I can express that this is actually creating a new thing. I'll figure out how to do that diagrammatically. That would be nice. But this, this is showing that we've, um, we have this process through uh, the states. Only some things are relevant at some points. And we can only send, um, so I haven't written in, in, in this diagram, but we can only send and receive messages on the sockets uh, if, it, uh, if that socket is open. And actually, there's a, there's a bit more to it even than this. So this is, this is the low-level process of creating a socket. Once we have that socket, we're now onto the, into the realm of a high-level protocol. And at that point, we need to establish what the appropriate uh, communication pattern is between the client and the server. So once we have an open socket, we haven't finished, we have to send and receive messages from the right order. So that's where session is. So I'd like to be able to express this low-level socket API but I'd also like to be able to use that low-level socket API to implement a higher-level protocol that maybe just says, you know, send a message <coughs> and receive a reply. Uh, so I guess I should start with a smaller example before we go fully onto um, uh, onto, onto the, the, the network protocol. I want to show something that's, that's not too dissimilar to what you've seen yesterday, and then then crack it up to. Uh, working with a, a generic system. So, so we'll work with, um, just a, as a, 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 a warm-up, uh, imagine you have uh, a data store, there is some secret data in that data store, you have to log in before you read the data, and you have to log out when you're done, and logging in might fail. So this, this should be something that's familiar from yesterday, this is something rather similar to what we were doing at the door, except that once, once we're in, we have this operation we can do of, of, of reading the secret data. Okay? So, the challenge is to come up with some kind of system in which we can write a sockets API that's, um, that does exactly the same as we saw with the C implementation, but expresses everything we need to know about it. And, and so that we can say, I mean, people say about, um, this, this is a, a, a terrible thing you hear about Haskell libraries quite often. People say, I don't need to write documentation because the types tell me everything about it. Well, not really. Uh, maybe to some extent. And, and I kind of want to get to a point where we can say that sort of thing, maybe not quite with a straight face, but we, <laughs> we can at least say it with a little bit more honesty that the types can at least guide us to the program. So what we're trying to do is give descriptive APIs to say for systems. And I have, I have quite a long wish list about uh, what I want in this API. And I, I'll leave it to you to judge later whether, whether I achieve it. Um, so we want to, we certainly want to capture the state of you know, the data store, the socket, the file, the communication channel, all of the things we might. And if you, if you look at, um, at any program of any realistic scale, you will see state machines implicitly everywhere, so you the ATM, everywhere. We want to capture, at each point of the program, we want to capture what state each of our resources is in, so that we can do operations that make sense of that. So that's, that's number one point. So we also want to say, um, when any, so for any operation that we run on some state, we want to be able to say exactly when that operation is valid. So uh, maybe that would be a predicate on the state, maybe that would just be say, saying if something is only valid in this specific state. So essentially, the precondition for the operation. We want to be able to say, for every operation, we want to be able to say how that operation affects its environment, so that might be how it affects a resource, how it, possibly how it affects multiple resources, if it creates resources or well, deletes resources, so that is, if it closes a file, if it closes a connection. Um, so essentially, that's a post condition on an operation. And like we saw with the door yesterday, um, if you get some results, you'll get different effects on the environment. So if opening the door fails, you have a closed door rather than open door. If logging into the data store fails, you have a logged out store rather than a logged in store, so we want to be able to express that kind of thing precisely in the type. Um, we want to interoperate with other stateful APIs, meaning that we want lots of these things at once. So any realistic system is dealing with multiple uh, resources, multiple state tracking systems at the same time, and they might be implemented in terms of each other. It's like a, a whole hierarchy of state machines. State machines all the way there. Um, so uh, this is um, this is something that people often forget. This, 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 um, this requirement. It's kind of important to me that the APIs and programs remain readable. You should be able to look at a program and say, "Yeah, I know what that does because all it's doing is telling me the operations that are, that are running." 
traditionally telling me what the um, um, you know, what the types of each operation are. So um, whether it's readable, this is this is highly subjective. Theory, but, um, nevertheless, it's a good thing to bear in mind that uh, you know if if only I can use this library, it's use, it's useless. It's, 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 so it's got to be something that other people can look at it and, and say, yeah, I can, I can understand. That. So in particular, that means uh, there's a lot of um, potential, a lot of um, uh, there's a risk that there's a lot of necessary proofs in this kind of system. So I, I have to prove what state something is in at what time, and I really want to avoid that. I really want to make this something that uh, you can just write transitions. Um, here's, the, here's the hardest one. Uh, there should be helpful error messages. Um, so anyone who's used any system with any kind of um, precise or rich types will, will recognize that error messages are not always um, the most helpful. So, so We'll see if there are things we can do to make the error messages just a bit better uh, uh, or a bit more helpful to us. So um, some of these things might, you might be thinking of various other uh, possible programs. <coughs> and this, um, this is certainly inspired by a lot of work that's gone before. So in particular, uh, if you've encountered separation logic, um, what we're going to see here is, is, is not entirely far away from being an implementation of separation logic um, in Idris as a, as a library. Um, I've seen why not, anyone can of why not? So this is a, a cop library for working with imperative programs. Uh, so it's a base on ball logic, which I think probably why it's only backwards. Um, probably. Um, we all enjoy the time in common science circuits. Uh, or index one as linear type. All of these things, you'll, you'll, you'll spot some similarities, you'll, you'll, you'll spot a lot of relationships. I don't want to go into too much depth about exactly what the relationship is between all of these things, but all of these things are things that are worth reading about. So, so you know, do, do go off and look at them and see if you think that uh, what I'm talking about is better or worse. So, um, here's the, 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 the core of what's going on in the mic. This is everything is based around uh, this type. ST, which I guess it's, uh, it stands for state transformer. I call it ST because that's what the why not type is. ST. Um, so uh, it's it's somewhat familiar to what we were talking about yesterday. And what we were talking about yesterday was this type of um, uh, stateful DSLs where you have uh, the type of the operation, you have the precondition, and then you have the operation that you're returning. So the, the, the effect of that operation on the environment. So remember that's one of the things I'm aiming at here in this API, is to have, um, to be able to describe the effect of operations on the environment, but there might be lots more environments than, um, than just one. So, so we have, as before, we have a result type. Um, not quite as before, so slightly more complicated than before. Instead of just having the input state and the output state, we have a list of all the things that happen to the state. So I'll show you in a moment what this uh, action tie is all about. But really what um, the, the, the essence of it, what you need to know for now, is that that is a list of things that happen to the world as a result of this operation. So a list of, a list of transitions from input to output as a result of this operation. Uh, this M that you see, this is because uh, we're, being, um, we're being generic in the context of these programs. So for example, running an SD program under I.O., uh, might have some um, interaction with the outside world, just as, like with, a, with an operating system calls. But maybe we have some other context in which we can run it that allows it to run on, I don't know, a robot arm operating a door, which is probably not the same as I have in a different, uh, um, uh, different context. Or maybe running it in a pure context, in a, or running it, running it in an identity context. No, I'm saying context, I'm definitely not saying the N word. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, the name M is somewhat suggestive, um, but it's actually more about context. Um, we don't, it, 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 it could be any context, it could be like the identity function. Um, so the M word, of course, is, is burrito. <laughs> <laughs> the M word is monad. Um, so so generally, the, generally, the context in which you're running will be a monad, um, but it doesn't have to. It's, it's a thing that transforms uh, the, you know, the, the, the type you're working with into you know, some actual concrete thing. So when we start, when we run these programs, eventually, you know, they might go through 
uh, main, main has type IO, and so the furthest end will be IO. But generally, we're writing in, a, in, a, in as generic a context as we can, and we'll explain how to run each operation. So we'll see, we'll see some examples of that. Um, so, as, a, as an example of uh, a program, so without telling you anything about the, the operations in, in ST, I want to show you a program first. Because I want to give you the impression of what programs might look like. And um, just to let you think before you've seen anything, whether you consider these programs readable. Um, so, I'll tell you what's happening here, just to give uh, an overview of what's happening. Um, so, this program. Is, it's an SD program. It runs in any context M, provided that context, in that context, we know how to implement console IO and we know how to implement the data store operations. So this is a fairly common pattern that you might see in Haskell programming. So it's having something generic in some in some monad, but you have some uh, some like uh, type pattern that say specifically which monads you're allowed to pick, so which interfaces you have to implement for this for this thing to work. Um, so it returns unit type, so it's, it um, just uh, produces nothing of any particular interest. And this, this empty list, this is our list of actions. Now what it means by being an empty list here is that there are no resources available when we start running this program, and there are no resources available when we finish running this program. But we can do what we like in the middle. So it's, it's really saying that everything we do in the middle, we have to clean up our process. So we can create a connection to some store, we can open the door, and we can send stuff over a network, provided that whatever we do, we clean it up after we finish it. So we, what's happening is we connect to some data store, called ST, we try to log in on that data store, if we fail, so if, if there's a bad password, then we just print the message and, and disconnect from the store. Um, if we succeed, we'll read the secret from the store, we'll print it out, log out and disconnect. So all of these steps have to happen. So after I've connected, if login fails, I have to disconnect, or it won't type check. Uh, once I've logged in, I have to log out, or it won't type check. And I have to disconnect at the end, or it won't type check. So um, leaving aside the fact that I haven't explained anything about ST yet, is, is that considered vaguely readable, do you think? You can, you can see what's happening here. So this is absolutely full of dependent types, you just can't see them. Kind of a gun. Uh, other questions? Uh, what's the type of good string in? Um, I'll come to that. Okay. It's, it's, I mean, what's it, um, it's, it's really console I.O. It, it, it's generic in console yeah, I.O. Yeah. So I'll, I'll show you the types of all of these things. Really, at the minute, I just want to give you a flavor of what programs actually look like. And to say a crucial thing that at least I believe about dependency type programming is that um, the dependent uh, the, the, the type system is really there to allow you as library writers to give precise types to your libraries to um, really be clear about what your APIs are doing. And it's not something that, that, that the application developer should really be having to think about too deeply. They, they should look at the type of your API and, uh, and see what they have to do, but you should try really hard to set things up so that uh, the types themselves are maybe not invisible, but they're, they're abstracted away. So we are quite used to writing, when we write programs in uh, you know, Java or C or whatever, uh, we, um, we'll hide all of the complicated details behind an API. We'll put that all inside a function and hide it. Well, types are first class, so we can do exactly the same thing with types. I mean, they may be doing some incredibly complicated things, but that doesn't mean that, they have that, that, that those complicated things have to be visible. But we should try very hard to make the types Look as simple as possible as far as the product application is concerned. So, um, let's see a bit more about how this actually works. So, um, what is ST? So, ST um, is itself um, not really a data type, rather a type level function. And it's a type level function which translates this list of actions. So, remember, actions are, are transitions on individual resources. Um, but what we really want to be thinking about, or what the system really needs to be thinking about, is what resources it has available at any, at any given point. So any operation will have uh, a list of input resources, and it will have a list of output resources. Just like our door had one single input resource, so the door state, and one single output resource, the new door state, our operations in ST will have a list of input resource states and a list of output resource states. 
There's no guarantee, or there's no requirement that these lists are the same length. In fact, it's incredibly useful uh, to not have them the same length. See how that goes. So we don't have any, we don't have any particular um, uh, constraints on, on, on them, other than there are in the resources, there are actual lists. Yeah? Why only have one list? Uh, why only have one list? Because well, two different lists. Oh, um, so why, do you mean why have a list of inputs and a list of outputs? Yeah, I was one. Uh, because, uh, so we have, we have a list of actions, so one list of actions. So that needs to translate into a list of input resources and a list of output resources because we need to know that there is only one, there is one state available at any, um, yeah, one set of resources available at any particular point, and the length of that thing changes in kind of interesting ways uh, throughout the program. And it, it just becomes easier to write the underlying operations if you have the input resources and the output resources. Um, it is quite possibly desirable to re-implement this so you really do only have that one list. And in fact, I tried, but I found that it was way more complicated than it needed to be. Complicated than it needed to be. And I, I sort of start getting twitchy when my programs feel complicated. So, so I, I, I felt that it worked out simpler. Um, um, right, so what is, what is the thing that happens underneath? Well, ST translates um, uh, your list of actions into something a bit more like this. Now, this, this, is, this is the real underlying data type. So this is, this is the concrete underlying data type for all of our operations. So an M as before, uh, the underlying context of um, Ms. Um, so the, 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 the M in which we are running. Um, there's a result type just as before. And then this, this, these next two, these are, uh, this, this should look familiar from yesterday. So remember yesterday we had door state as the input and then tie arrow door state as the output. So an output that's, that, that's generated from the result of an operation. So now we have resources is, well, it's a list of resources, and then this resources, an output list of resources. So the kinds of things you can do, or I should say what resources are. Um, so resources are um, really capturing the type of, of each thing that we're working with. It's, it's kind of like, um, we're kind of doing imperative programming with dependent types here in, in that uh, we're, we're, we're saying what is available at each step of the program. And we're saying this, this var is, it, it's really a, just a reference to, to a particular thing. So this is, generally you refer to this by some variable name. And then this is, uh, the type of the thing that's going to be available when we run the program. So you typically write these things as, if you, if you imagine some resource list, uh, this, this var is for referring to it. Because we have lots of these things, we need to have a way of referring to lots of different things. So there is something called door, and it's a closed door. And there is something else called count, and that is in uh, an int state. Or we might, have a, we might have a couple of doors. So D1 is a door that's closed, D2 is a door that's open, and then ST is a store that's logged in. So we can, have, we can have lots of things available in our resource lists, and we refer to them by one of these labels. So the var is, is, is basically just a label for that, uh, for that thing. And this triple colon is, well, it's because a thing has a, is in a particular state. That state is a type. And we've used single and double colon, so let's just add more colons. <laughs> There's probably a better name for this, but uh, there you go. I guess if I, uh, if I was an Agda programmer, I could just use a different colon, couldn't I? Um, yeah, <laughs> let's, not, let's not go there. Um, so, um, so everything we're working with, uh, uh, um, this, this whole thing is about managing these resources. E everything we are able to access at any point in the program is a labeled resource. So what about actions? So there's a few actions that we can do. Um, an action is either saying that a resource stays in the same state. So on input and output to a collection of operations, stable says that this variable has this type on input and output. So that is going to translate into uh, the same resource list or the same entry in the resource list uh, on the input and the output. Trans says that we have a variable which starts in this type and ends in this type. So, so the type that action is parameterized by, this is the type of the overall operation. So if I have, if I have a function that returns an int, then they will have a corresponding action int. So trans says that if well, an action returning something of type tie will take an input state of type and will give us back an output state computed from the result of the operation. 
So it's also useful to be able to add and remove resources. So if you imagine, uh, you remember connect and disconnect we saw in that uh, get data and, uh, program, in, in that program that connects to the data store. So connecting to a data store will use add to give us back a new variable, a new resource. And then disconnecting from the data store, we'll use remove to say that that variable is no longer needed. So the type on remove says we are removing um, a resource that begins in this state. So the state given by this type. So maybe this makes a bit more sense with some examples. So um, let's say we are, the, the, if, we're reading from the, if we're reading the secret from the data store, the state transition that's going to happen there, the action that's going to happen there is the store called ST is stable in the logged in state. So it starts in the logged in state, ends in the logged in state. That's when we're allowed to read the secret. Or if we're logging out of the store, the store will start in the logged in state and it will end in the logged out state. And when we're, doing a, when, we're, when we're changing the state, remember that changing the state is a function of the result of the operation. So this const just says, well, discard the result of the operation. It always ends in the logged out state. Uh, disconnecting from the store, a uh, store called ST says that th th this says that we are removing or we are logging out from a store that uh, from, sorry, we are removing a store that happens to be in the logged out state. And then finally, this is the, this is the most fiddly one, uh, add. Uh, with add, uh, you're returning um, something, you're returning a variable. So add um, uh, could create, uh, add is allowed to create some list of resources. There might be, there might be lots more than one resource it's creating. So you might, be, you might be creating a connection to a server and you might be creating a state that goes along with it. So you're allowed to create multiple things. So this is, um, Whatever, whatever your variable is, it's, it's, it's creating a new resource um, a, a attached to that variable. So um, there are, uh, so uh, this is a question, yes? So is this going to allow you to require to be in a specific state, or what if you want to set a specific state, like you have to be in a specific state to satisfy You could do that too. Um, I've, I've in, this, in fact, I'm going to show an example of that. Uh, the, I'm just giving a few simple examples here. So you can go, uh, you could go way more sophisticated than this. And then, uh, sorry, yes. Should add say like type or var the resources or then by the resources? Um, no, because th this is translating to uh, a resource list. So, so this um, this allows you to write functions which return. So, so what what is a var? I guess is the the, um, the essence of your question is what on earth is a var? That, you might not think that's what you're asking, but I, I mean, I'm looking at the definition of this. <laughs> probably not. Uh, I mean, I'm probably. Uh, so var is not necessarily going to be a tie. So var is. Um, uh, hang on. Uh, yeah. So so what typically happens? I'll, I'll explain this in terms of what actually happens. What typically happens is you write a function that returns a new var. So that var oh. is is something that you're then going to use to refer to things later on. So this oh. add allows you to say that the the var that you've created. This is how we're going to refer to it later on. And, um, so that happens to be an action bar. Yeah. So, so it, it, could, it could be other things, but it's, um, it's much more likely to be something uh, like this. I mean, the, instead of this being a var, it could be some variable you already have, and the var could appear here. So it's a bit more flexible. Um, we should see some examples, because there's, um, there's a couple of, there's a few things going on here, and it all ties together eventually. So it's, uh, we have to sort of see a few things before, before we see um, exactly how it works internally. So um, this notation is a bit ugly, I think. So, so I'm, I'm in general a big fan of using words as uh, function names and type names. Um, I've made an exception here because I want to make some kind of uh, notation that actually looks like state transitions. So I may not have got this right quite yet, but I'll show you the notation I have, and that's, the, and that's what we're going to work with. So the, uh, an alternative notation we're going to work with is uh, this one. So this st triple colon store logged in, this is a notation, so I've overloaded the triple colon. This is an action which is saying that st, oops, which is that uh, st is a store that's logged in. And then the second one, st is a store, is, is an action that represents a store that starts in the logged in state and ends in the logged out state. And then we've got a couple of other functions. So add and remove say so that uh, we, are, we are adding a, a resource that's a store in the logged out state. We're removing uh, a, 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 a store that starts in the logged out state. So uh, just a, this, this turns out to be, or this appears to be a more consistent notation that we can use throughout. 
OK, so let's see, let's see how this works for the operations in the data store, and then we'll move on to uh, uh, network sockets. So general idea from here on. So this is crucial. The crucial thing is that we have this ST data type, and we are allowed to say the things that are happening over the run of a program. So the top level type of a program is going to say what type we start in, or what resources we have at the beginning, what resources we have at the end, through the uh, medium of um, action descriptions. And in general, what we're going to do to write larger programs and compose them is we are going to define interfaces which say the things that we're allowed to do on a particular uh, resource type. So um, we'll write, so the first thing I'll do is define an interface for the data store. That interface will say that there is a data store type. There are um, various operations that we can do on that data store type, but we're going, to, we're going to abstract away what the store type actually is. So we're only going to work in terms of this, this generic interface. And when it comes to implementing this thing and running it, we will implement the interface for different contexts. So we'll, we'll, we'll provide, maybe we'll provide an implementation for I.O., maybe we'll provide an implementation for uh, some pure context so that we can, we can do reasoning about the program, so maybe we can... Um, uh, maybe we can do tests by implementing the context for some, some pure environment that, that, that just simulates I.O. Um, and when we come to writing our um, actual programs, uh, we'll constrain those programs to only use the interfaces that we actually need in those programs. So I like to think of these as, you know, when you download something from the Android app store, it says what permissions it has. I like to think of these uh, interfaces as describing permissions for your program. So in this... Um, in this program we had earlier, this program has the permissions to do console I.O. and interaction with the data store, but it doesn't have any more permissions. So even though this program, when it comes to running it, it's an interactive program, it is not, just because it's an interactive program, it's not allowed to delete files or you know, launch missiles or whatever, the, um, wh whatever things you can do in I.O. So we're just allowing the, these things, and these things explain how they um, uh, interact with the environment. Uh, so, uh, for the data store, this is what it's going to look like. Um, so I haven't shown you interfaces yet, but uh, interfaces are basically like Haskell type classes, but we use the keyword interface and we use the keyword implementation instead of the keywords uh, class and instance. So the reason we call them interfaces rather than type classes is because is they have slightly different, um, slightly different behaviors. So you can have multiple implementations of a type class, for example, and, and give them explicit names. Um, and there's, they're, they're a little bit less restrictive than type classes, but that also means you get slightly uh, weaker properties. And um, uh, just as an aside, uh, one of the written questions I got uh, either yesterday or the day before was, um, is it too late to have modules, ML-style modules in Idris? Because it's obviously too late for Haskell. Is it too late for Idris? Well, I have been thinking about this, uh, about implementing modules, and I, I started thinking about what would be necessary to implement ML-style modules. And I ended up realizing that interfaces and implementations are almost exactly ML modules with a couple of things they can do better and a couple of things they can't quite do as well. So the answer to that question is, I'm not going to implement ML style modules because we have interfaces. And the thing I show you, the thing I'm going to show you here is I think at least some part of the argument that interfaces are near enough to modules to be, um, uh, to be usable that way. So interfaces are, like all things, first class. So you can do you know, mad things like having implementations of interfaces inside where clauses in, in your function. That's a, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, because maybe you want a different interface, a uh, different implementation, depending on the size of a data structure or whatever. So, so you can do all sorts of cool stuff and, uh, with interfaces. It's a question of whether you should, but there's, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot you're able to do with them. So anyway, yeah, we're going we're gonna to describe the interface, and then we're going to provide an implementation that allows us to run these things. So uh, we'll start with the easiest one, so reading the secrets. Um, so in, inside our interface, we're going to say, if we have some store, which is a variable, so var just says it's a thing that we have, and then the list of actions tells us more about the thing that we have. So it's a variable, and it begins and ends in the logged in state. So this is like uh, with our... With our door, we could only ring the bell when the door was closed. Well, our, our data store, we can only read the secret when the store is logged in. Or for logging out, this is given a store. Um, logging out will take the store from the logged in state to the logged out state. OK, fairly natural, I hope. Um, 
So the, the, uh, the, this, this effort we've gone to with describing actions and this notation for describing transitions means that when you come to write the operation, they really do look like state transitions. That's, that's really the goal of this, uh, of this gratuitous overloading of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of names. What about logging in? This is almost logging in. This is almost right for logging in. Um, can you see the problem? So given a store, starts in the logged out state, ends in the logged in state. Well, it might not end in the logged in state. It might, it might fail. Notice, by the way, I've said nothing about how the login process works here. So I've said nothing about whether I'm entering a password, whether, whether I'm using my fingerprints or, or anything. I'm just saying that this is, this is a login operation. And uh, just to refine it slightly, um, it's a login operation that might fail. So I've called it bad password. So I guess that does imply I'm intending to use a password here. So when it comes to implementing this, so when I, when I, when I implement the interface for some particular context, I am going to, at that point, have to explain how logging in works. But when it comes to writing programs, that's all abstract. That's just a, that's just a thing that will be handled in, in some concrete way later. So um, we need to refine that type slightly. And just as we did with the, um, the door programs earlier, um, we, instead, of, instead of giving a transition from the input state to the output state, this is, this is actually yet another overloading of Arrow. Uh, this, um, the, the output thing is a function, and it's a function of the result. So this lambda res, this is going to take whatever the result happens to be, it's going to take that result and calculate the output state uh, once it knows at compile time which branch of the program you're in. So just, uh, just expressing that um, uh, the environment has to have a store that's logged in, and when we're finished, that store is either logged in or logged out, depending on whether the operation was successful. So precondition and postcondition again. So the result, this, uh, oh, that should be login result. Thank you. This is, this is why I like to do live coding. Because uh, compilers don't, you let it, don't let you get away with, uh, with uh, typos like that. So um, I, do have, I do have the code. We'll run the code in a moment. Um, so yeah, so this, this should be login result. And then lambda res takes a login result. Um, so we'll need to be able to connect to a store. I mean, we might, we might want to connect to multiple stores of multiple different forms. So connecting to a store, this is something that will return a variable. So this is the variable we're going to use to re refer to the store uh, later on. And it will add a store that, initially, that is initially in the logged out state. So this, this add is a function that says, whatever it is we're adding, this is the state it's in. Um, so we also need to disconnect. And we'll put all of this stuff inside a data store interface. The interface includes the definition of the type of store. So uh, the store has some, the current um, access mode, which is either logged in or logged out. And when we come to implement the store, that will, be, that will be implemented by some concrete type. So whether that concrete type is some network handle or some file handle or whatever it is, is completely uh, abstract here. We're just talking about the interface. So disconnecting from the store says, we can remove the store provided that it's logged out. And then we've got all the other things, log in, log out, and read secret. Uh, so eventually, uh, we'll get around to implementing this thing. So to implement this thing, uh, we say that we're implementing it in some specific context. And when it comes to implementing it in some specific context, we have to say um, exactly what it is we're working with. So in this case, I'm just going to represent the store as some string. So, so it's, it's, it's a string that represents the data that I'm hard coding into the program, just to, just to keep things simple. And in order to implement this thing, as well as the operations um, log in, log out, read secret, we're going to need to uh, create resources, delete resources, read and write resources. So there's going to be some, some lower level stuff that's going on manipulating an internal state. So this type state string, this, this state <coughs> is actually part of the ST um, system. So we can only um, work with things that have type. We can only read and write things that have, have one of these state types. And so that means that by hiding things behind an interface, it's only when we're inside the interface that we know that the store is implemented by a string, a state string, and we can only read and write things that use the state type. So it's, it's, it's definitely hidden away, and the, only the implementation of the interface can ever get at the, the internal details. So I'll just show you what they look like. Uh, I'll do this fairly quickly, and then we'll go on to the example. So, so new, uh, given some initial value, 
new will add a thing to the list of resources that is in that state. Uh, to delete a thing, given some label and some proof that that label exists in the current list of resources, then it will drop it from the list of resources. So we saw this auto proof yesterday. In state is a predicate that says a label exists in the current, uh, in the current environment. So if that label exists in the current environment, delete will drop it from the current environment. So I won't go into more details on how that works. Just the, the, the crucial thing is that you can new always create something with a state type and delete can only ever delete something with a state type. So you have to know the concrete representation in order to delete something. This is, this is important because it means you can never delete something that you're not entitled to delete. Uh, so reading and writing is uh, similar in the, the thing that we're talking about has to be a state type. So if we have something of type state tie and we read it, that gets us back the tie. Uh, if we have something uh, of state tie, uh, then we can write it and that will update the type of the thing. So we can, um, it's like, um, it, it's we are allowed to change the type of things in the environment because as we run the program, we always know uh, what the type of the thing is that we're working with. So we're like dynamically updating the type of the thing that we have. So it's like dynamic types. Statically checked dynamic types. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> right, so let's let's just see that let's see that happening. Um, so I think I, I know I went uh, a bit quickly through the types of these operations. I think in this case it's it's important to see to like just get a get a feel for what the operations are and you can you can study the types a bit more closely later on. The important thing to realize is that uh, read, write, new, and delete uh, are the way of introducing concrete resources, and you can only work with concrete resources if you really know that they are uh, of state type. So um, I did have this just just for reference. If um, I'm not going to sh show this too much now, but just for reference, I did um, I did that login system in the style we did yesterday, just as this uh, type plus interpreter DSL. Um, so you can you can compare the two, but we, you can do that um, sort of offline. So. Uh, so what it looks like is this, um, we have the access, we have the login result, and then this is the interface we've just seen except without the typo because it's type checked. Um, so you'll see that uh, inside that interface we've got all of these operations, um, and then we'll write a program on that interface that allows us to connect to a store, do stuff with it, read the secret, and then disconnect. And then later on I have an implementation of the store <coughs> Uh, so the store is going to be represented by a concrete string. Uh, so when we connect to the store, I'm just going to invent some secret data, which is in fact self-descriptive secret data. Uh, it's a string secret data. Uh, so to log into the store, I have to enter the password. If I correctly enter the hard-coded password, then, um, then it will give me the data back. If I enter the wrong password, it'll say bad password. So it's only at this point where we implement the thing, where we implement the store, that we genuinely have to explain how logging in works. And we can implement this login in whatever way we like. So it's, um, if you've seen algebraic effects and handlers, it's almost, it's a bit like uh, providing multiple different handlers for uh, the operations that we're describing. So this is where we provide a handler for the operation we're describing. Uh, and then uh, reading the secret just reads the result of the store. And then finally, for any ST program, you can run that ST program uh, so you've got, you can only run ST programs that start and end with, with no uh, resources available. And we can only run a program if we really have implemented the interface for the context we're working in. So in main, we're working in the IO context and we can run get data because get data is something that uh, needs console IO and data store. Console IO is part of the ST library that works in the IO context and data so I've explained how to implement that in the IO context. So I guess I could um, just um, try that out just to see how it works. So you need for this one you need um, dash p contribs to, to, to load. So it's um, contrib is um, it's, it's a package that contains essentially contributions. So things that we haven't put into the main library yet that maybe aren't finalized, things that still have work to be done. So ST is something that certainly isn't finalized, so it's part of the contrib library. And if you're doing this in Atom, there's, there's a bit of trickiness if, if you're doing it in Atom, which is that, um, so you need to have a, a project folder, so add project folder, uh, and there needs to be a, a package description 
in the project folder. So if you download the code that I've uh, given you on, um, on the, on the uh, materials page, you'll find this file, um, sorry, it should be, uh, there's, there's a file called um, states.ipackage inside the lecture4 directory. So if you make lecture4, if you make that your um, project folder, then, then that should work. And this really just is just to say that uh, for this, I need, I, so I, this, this isn't in your version because you're not guaranteed to have the SDL library, but it, it, it's saying that it, for all of these things, you need to open the, uh, you, need to, you need to have access to the contract package. But just, to, just if, you, if you're trying these out, that's, uh, that's something you'll need to, uh, to do. So, um, yeah, if I, if I run that program uh, and I type the wrong password, um, then, it won't let me uh, won't let me at the data, whereas if I type the correct password, um, then it will let me have the data. Okay, so that's uh, uh, implementing that interface specifically for I/O, um, and we know that because you know that we, we we know that we've implemented the program following the right state because we put the state explicitly in the description of the interface. So it's worth showing what happens um, if if we get the program wrong. So remember on my wish list, uh, so I said the programs have to be readable, and well, I'm gonna argue that the programs are readable after you've, uh, after you've played with this for a bit, and I'm, I'm certainly gonna argue that, that this program, you can see what's going on. And uh, also, by the way, some criticism you often see of, uh, or sometimes see of, of dependently typed programming is that you have to put type annotations everywhere. Well, look, I haven't even said what state transitions are going on. I'm just saying it starts and ends with, with no resources available. And the machine's figuring out what's going on inside. So we certainly have to put the top level annotation, but we don't have to put annotations absolutely everywhere. We, 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 need, we need types of individual operations, but I think that's a good idea. And we need types of the top level thing, but we don't need to be explaining throughout what is happening to, uh, in each of the operations. So let's, let, let's try a thing. We've got a program here that um, connects to a data store and then attempts to read the secret without, uh, without logging in first. So let's see what happens if we put that in our program. We get, we get a slightly less horrific error message than you might have suspected. Um, so it, uh, it still leaves a little bit to be desired, but uh, you can see that uh, so at a particular line that's gone wrong, it says that there's an error in the state transition, which is exactly true. This is, we, we, we have, we've attempted a state transition that's not allowed. It says that the operation we're trying has the precondition that the store is logged in, but the states here are that the store is logged out. And then it prints the post conditions even though, even though they're, they're both the same. So what we've done here is taken the error message that has come out of the system and um, so, so one of the fantastic things that uh, David did for uh, Idris was this error reflection mechanism. So you can, you can sort of identify specific kinds of error messages. So if you're writing a, a, an embedded domain-specific language, which is basically what strands is, if you're writing that kind of domain-specific language, you can generally see the same kind of error messages um, for the operations you're doing. Uh, the, the, the error messages have the same form. So if you know what the error messages are likely to look like, um, and you have a mechanism which allows you to rewrite error messages, that's what you should do. So what I've done here is said, well, any, any, error, in, any error message that says there's a mismatch between S trans this and S trans that, what I'll do is instead of displaying the whole thing, I will show the bit of the state transition that's gone wrong. So I think this is, this is at least some way towards uh, making readable error messages for this kind of uh, specific purpose system. Um, right, so there's, uh, that's, that's the basics of using ST. That, that, that is a way of um, having, multiple, oh, having, having a resource that we can create and destroy as we like and having an interface that, uh, that, that says, or having a, that making an interface that says what each operation does. So what, what we've um, really done is we've, we've separated the, um, the things we can do with resources from the specific resources we're working with. So um, has anyone ever read uh, the fantastic paper, The Next 700 Programming Languages by Peter Landon? 
That's uh, one of my favorite papers, possibly my favorite paper ever, ever. And if you haven't read it, you should. But one of the things he says right at the beginning is that most programming languages are, um, you have um, a basic set of given things. So you have your primitives. And you have a way of combining those primitives. And what you can do to make a whole variety of programming languages is change the basic things you have. So I'm going to claim that uh, ST, this, uh, this ST system, is your way of combining things. And then by implementing your interface, that's, that's creating a new basic set of, of, of primitives, basic set of given things. So you can build, it's like build your own DSL. Build your own DSL for, for the kinds of states you care about. Now, what we haven't seen yet is how to deal with multiple things at once. So we've only had one, we've only been working with one uh, resource here. And things can get a little trickier if you're working with more than one resource. So, uh, oh, uh, just if you are interested, uh, there's another thing that I've put in the code, which is using, using strands directly rather than using st. So if you want to see how the two map, you can, you can look at uh, this other version, state three. Um, so um, let's, let's look at another small example um, and see how, to, see how to work with multiple states. So imagine, well, we'll just go back to the door. I love going back to this door example because it's, it's nice and small. So I've got a program here that, that, that is um, explaining the, that door state machine but using the ST uh, framework. So uh, opening a door just like before, starts in the closed state, uh, ends in either closed or open, depending on whether opening the door was successful. Uh, closing the door goes from open to closed, and we can only delete the door, as in we, we can only finish with the system if the door is closed. Um, so uh, we have a program at the end. This is a door program that creates a door, uh, opens it, closes it, and then deletes it. So, so if the door jams, I have to delete it. So I have to, I have to clean up in all the branches. And let's just, um, let's, um, I'll comment out this, um, this program. And um, it's interesting to see, um, if, you, if you have a partially written program, it's interesting to look at the, the types of the, of the intermediate states. And in fact, if you're working with ST, if you're writing programs in ST, it's a really good idea to do them step by step and just, um, just do like one thing at a time, and just do one step at a time. So if I check the type of what now, it, um, uh, when it wakes up, uh, it tells me that D, the, cu the current things I have, uh, or the current thing I have, is called D, and it's a door type in the closed state. And by the time I've finished, I'd better have no resources. OK, so that means that uh, I, can, I can open this door because I, I have a door. Um, but it'd be kind of fun to have a second door, wouldn't it? Because we've got two doors here, so let's have another door. Um, and I mean, re remember, one of the purposes of this system is I wanted to be able to just arbitrarily add and remove things and work with multiple things at once, but have them, have them independent. So basically, composing multiple things. So check the type of what now, now, and it tells me, oh, it tells me it's broken. Why is it broken? It tells me it's broken because, uh, let's, let's make this readable. Um, and this is, this is annoying, but fixable. Um, it tells me that the precondition on new door is that there are no doors or there are no resources, but I have one door available. And that's really annoying. I want to be able to compose these things and I want, to, I want to be able to work with multiple things at once, but somehow the precondition on this, on all of these operations, so th th these actions are computing uh, preconditions that, that say, I, I, in the case of new door, I have no doors. In the case of ring bell, I have exactly one door. So this is where, um, this is where a bit of separation logic comes in. So uh, if, you've, if you've encountered separation logic, you might have seen the frame rule. So the frame rule allows you to talk about a smaller collection of things, so a smaller collection of, um, of uh, well, in, in, in terms of ST, smaller collection of resources. Um, once you've worked with those resources uh, and, and, and done those state transitions, you can lift it back into the, the outer state. So we have a function called call, which implements pretty much that. 
So given some, given some state transition system that starts with a subset of effects, or subset of resources, I should say, and, and ends up with a new set of resources, and given a proof that that subset of resources is a subset of our current set of resources, called old here, so sub is a subset of the old set, then the final set of resources is computed by doing the transitions and then putting the result of those transitions back into the, 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 current, uh, the current set. So the upshot of all of this is what I have to do in order to, you know, the, all, all you really have to remember in practice is if you have more resources than, than the function requires, you need to use call. So if I call new door now, uh, it will say, OK, you've got more resources than you needed, but that's OK. Uh, I'll just work with the subset, and then I'll put the newly created resources into the environment. So if I check the type of what now, it says, uh, OK, that's great. Now we have D is a door that's closed, and D2 is a door that's closed. So we can, we can pick one of them that we want to open. Um, so let's, let's, let's try opening D2, and we have to use call because um, open door requires, requires exactly one door, and we have two. So let's, let's open D2 uh, and check the type. And uh, well, what went wrong? What did I call it? I called it door open, not open door. Um, OK, so now I have D is a door that's still closed, and D2 is a door that's in this unresolved state. So it's a little bit annoying to have to put call everywhere. Um, so what you can do, this isn't by default, because it's, it's much clearer to know what's going on if you have to make things explicit. Um, but you can, um, there is a, I, I'm, I'm never quite sure if this is a misfeature, but something like this, uh, I find it incredibly useful. Um, so you can, um, you can say that a function is implicit. So you can declare functions with an implicit modifier. What that does is it says if, if you have a thing, if you have a function or if you have an expression that doesn't type check and calling, this, calling the implicit function would fix that type error, then it will implicitly put that function in. So it's like, a, like an implicit coercion in Coq or an implicit coercion in Scala. Uh, I, I strongly recommend using these very sparingly. Um, but in this kind of situation, it really does make your programs uh, much nicer to work with. So now we can do... Um, so by importing implicit call, it's importing a version of that function that is implicit. So now this is OK to type check. So we've only got about five minutes left, and I haven't got on to networking. So let me show you networking. Let me, like, now you've seen how, this, um, how the system works. Now you've seen how you can compose uh, the state machines. We can see a little bit about what that sockets API looks like. So... Um, Oh, I lost it while I, I, I closed it by accident. So let's uh, let's open it again. So remember, remember the state machine. In fact, I can show you the state machine again. So remember this state machine. So we're, 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 we've got five different states of sockets. Um, so I define the five different states of sockets, and we define an interface just like I did with um, with the uh, the login state. Um, so to create a socket, well, these things might fail. All of these operations might fail. Um, and if they fail, uh, we either lose the socket or we don't get a socket or the socket ends in the, in the closed state. So just by convention, I've said all of them return either something. Or, so even if the something is un uninformative, I've just put, used either. So creating a socket will either give us the unit type, in which case it's failed, or it'll give us a variable. And then this, this type level function add if write says, if this succeeds, we've added a socket in the ready state. And then all of the operations have, a, have a roughly the same sort of form, in that just as, as we did with the, uh, as you saw with the Haskell version, you've got uh, you know, the address, you've got the port, and it will return either success or fa or fa either failure or success. And the transition is going to be, well, it's got to start with a socket in the ready state, and it either ends with a socket in the closed state or in the bound state. So it's, um, this, this or, again, is a type level function that says, uh, what happens to the, to the resource if we succeeded or if we failed versus what happens to the resource if we succeeded. So each of the operations is exactly saying what the state transition is from that diagram. 
Um, so listening, listening for a, a connection starts in the bound state, and again, if it fails, we've given up. If it succeeds, we're in the listening state. The most interesting one is, is accept. So accepting a connection, after we've accepted a connection, we, have, we, we, we still have the socket listening for connections. So we can, we can keep listening for connections even after we've accepted one. So we can have multiple connections at once. But if it succeeded, then we have a new socket, which is in the open state. So this is, this is the first thing that we really couldn't capture in this, this old start. We couldn't capture the idea of having a transition and creating a new thing at the same time. So here, it's, here we, we, have, we have two actions. First, the first action is just, well, if we succeed, uh, uh, well, well, whether we succeed or not, we still have a listening socket. But if we do succeed, we now have another open socket. Um, and then the others follow the same sort of form. And eventually, we have to have an implementation. And this implementation, all it does is it takes these operations and translates them into the lower level I.O. version. So I could write an echo server uh, using this. So in order to connect, uh, so you've seen this pattern before. So uh, create a socket. If it succeeds, we have the socket. If it fails, we have to give up. So if I check the type of this socket, um, we'll see. Um, you'll see, you know, we now have a socket ready for a connection. And then go one more step. If we, ch if we check the type now, um, oh, that's taking a moment. We, we now have a socket that's bound. So, so as we do each operation, the current state of the system, if we look at this hole, so this is, you know, type-driven development in action again, you look at the hole, you see exactly what state we're in. So, so the, the system is telling you, um, you know, which operations are valid to do next. And I think if we're, if, we're, if we're able to provide APIs with this sort of level of precision, I think it's going to make it a lot easier to write tricky programs that work with, with tricky states. Now, it's very nearly the end, and I need to show you a slightly bigger example because I'm going to use the bigger example to do this, uh, this draw for the, for the prize. Um, so um, very quickly, I've shown you um, composing states kind of horizontally, multiple states but not implementing systems in terms of other states. So just imagine you have um, uh, a drawing API. So the drawing API has a surface to draw on. You can initialize a window. You can close a window. But you can only draw into the window when you've initialized it. Uh, so that's like a low-level API for drawing. So in this case, I've implemented it in terms of S STL, SDL. And then maybe you want to implement a higher-level interface on top of that. So it would be nice to, to have access to this lower-level implementation but say, say we're implementing turtle graphics, we're going to need not only the surface, but we're going to need the state of the turtle. So we're allowed to have uh, composite states. So inside, so I've got a turtle graphics API. Again, this API is completely independent of the drawing API. But when it comes to implementing it, uh, I'm allowed to have composite states. And I can, I can uh, build up uh, hierarchies of state machines by saying the implementation of the turtle is not only the surface, but a number of stateful components. So uh, that's, that's why I like to call this state machines all the way down. So obviously, I had to have turtles. Um, so um, I'm glad somebody got that. <laughs> um, so um, what I've done as the final example is implement a higher level network protocol, like a really simple higher level network protocol, but nevertheless higher level, but using, using this low level sockets API for the mechanics of the implementation. but um, a high-level state machine to say what part of the, of the, of the protocol we're in. So um, it's a random number server. So you can probably see where I'm heading. Um, this random number starts in a waiting state. So the waiting state is we don't have any connections yet. Um, or it might be in the processing state, means that it, meaning that it's received a message, but it hasn't sent a reply yet. And it finishes in the done state, meaning that it has both received a request and sent the reply. Uh, so this random session is implemented. I won't go through all of the details because you have this available. You can, you can go through this. Um, so there's a couple more things. Uh, so it's a, a little more complicated. So I need a few more. Um, I need a few more interfaces. So so sleep is. I put a gratuitous delay in just so that you can just to prove that things are running concurrently. So that we can we can spawn threads and this this stateful system allows us to when spawning threads say okay one one thread gets some of the resources. And another thread gets some of the other resources, but you can't send resources to two threads at once. So resources are kind of linear things. They're not shared. Uh, so yeah, receive a request, generate a random number, sleep for a second, and then send a reply. Um, 
So yeah, you, I'll, I'll let you go through that in your own time. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it to pick a random number between, I happen to know that there's 31 bits of paper here. All right, so I can start this server and I can, um, you know, if I, if, I, if I connect to this server and, you know, give a number, it will give me, after a second, it will give me a random number within those bands. And I guess I could tell that to it once and then um, tell that to it somewhere else, just to prove that concurrent connections are allowed. See, there's two, two connections received, just to, just, to, just to show that concurrency works. Um, and it's a number between 1 and 31 that we wanted. So um, let's, uh, let's have a look. Uh, it's, uh, please be a small one. Oh, for goodness sake. Um, 31, 29, 28, 27, 26. Uh, oh, I don't care. It's random enough. <laughs> um, it's Artem. That's you. Yes. This is yours. Right, so that's it for me. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I hope you've had a good time and I hope you enjoy the next uh, four days of lectures. Thank you. <laughs>